First of all, thank you all for coming to the talk today. Um, we're going to have a look at disability in the UK over time and how language usage at the time and to, to highlight terms that are ableist now and finish with the current government suggested inclusive terms. There are some trigger warnings throughout the presentation before each section to highlight the content that could be upsetting. If any of you find the content overwhelming at the time, please feel free to take a break from this session. So now we're gonna look at the pre 19th century. In this section, it contains references to ableist terms at the time and institutionalism and should take around 15 to 20 minutes. Firstly, I'm going to discuss disability in the context of the medieval period in the UK. At this time, disability was highly prevalent in daily life due to the nature of work at the time that was often backbreaking. Disease and individuals that were born with disabilities. At the time, society had mixed feelings towards disability overall. Some thought it was a punishment for sin, while others believed that individuals were closer to God due to their suffering through purgatory on earth rather than in death, which would get them to heaven sooner. Care was often provided by monks and nuns. Families and friends, and sometimes their villages or town, would support them. Caring for sick and disabled individuals was based on the church's teachings and following the seven comfortable works, which involved feeding, clothing, and housing the poor, offering drink to the thirsty, visiting the sick or imprisoned, and burial. This also included counsel and comfort for the sick. During this time, a network of hospitals based in religious establishments emerged. This led to the founding of the first mental institution called Bethlehem, nicknamed Bedlam. Alms houses were also founded to provide support for the disabled and infirm to live. However, only a small proportion of the disabled population lived in these places. Disabled people made pilgrimages to holy sites in search of a cure or relief. During this time, disabled people had to battle a lot of injustice. The people, religious institutions, towns, and cities during the medieval period were pioneers of providing specialized response to disability. Only a small number of their buildings remain, but over the next 500 years, their early approach would eventually develop into our modern system of public services. During this time, the king held rights and duties towards individuals that had learning disabilities. He would have custody over their property and assets, but also a duty to make sure they were properly cared for. On this slide in the box, I have highlighted terms that were historically used at the time, but are now ableist and not inclusive language. Now I'm going to discuss disability in the context of the Tudor to Stuart period. When Henry VIII split from the Catholic Church, he ordered the dissolution of the monasteries which most people learn about. What is not commonly known is in demolishing these religious houses, the hospitals and systems of care that had been established to support the sick and disabled people was destroyed. This led to poverty and a life on the streets for many individuals. In 1538, a petition to King Henry VIII called for the refoundation of the hospitals that had been closed or destroyed. This led to very little new building over the next 30 years though. Some new hospitals and some old ones were refounded. These were increasingly public funded buildings that were founded by the parish collections, taxes and donations. And by the end of the 16th century, new almshouses and hospitals were springing up. During the time, the poor acts were founded, which viciously punished individuals society classed as sturdy vagabonds, beggars with no disability or sickness preventing them from working. They could be whipped and branded at the time. The individuals they classed as the impotent poor, which they viewed as persons who were naturally disabled and unable to work, were viewed differently though, and were to be provided for and given allowances to provide for their maladies and needs. During this time, the Tudor court held a position as the natural fool, which is often referred to as a jester. These individuals would be recognized as having learn learning disabilities today. They held an elite royal position at court and were believed to be closer to God and closer to the truth than other people. At this time, Bethlehem Hospital was the only mental institution. In 1547, its first medically qualified superintendent was employed. 
the attitudes were starting to change. And at this time, mental conditions were increasingly seen as a matter for medical treatment. On this slide, I have highlighted as well terms that were historically used at the time, but are, not, are now ableist and not inclusive language today. Now I'm going to discuss disability in the context of the Stuart to Georgian period. After the Great Fire of 1666, it led to rich traders and merchants establishing a massive building project, which led to the Royal Bethlehem Asylum to be moved to Moorgate, close to our old workplace, and the founding of the Royal Chelsea and Greenwich um, Hospitals for Disabled Soldiers, which was done by Elizabeth I. In response to this, a voluntary asylum movement sprung up into existence. It was based on the belief that disabled people and people with mental health conditions would thrive in healthy, clean institutions. One of these was the York Retreat, which was founded by the Quakers. The societal sentiments at the time started to shift from believing that disabled individuals and people with mental health conditions could be restored with the right treatment and, um, and they have suffered a misfortune that deserved charity, leading to the belief it was a individual civic and Christian duty, not the state's. In a population of around 9 million people at the end of the 18th century, probably fewer than 10,000 individuals lived in an institution. However, the idea was growing that an institution was the right place for people who were classed as different. During this time, Peter the Wild, who's believed to have had a rare genetic disorder, was found in the woods outside Hanover and was brought to London to live with George I in St. James Palace until the court's curiosity waned after, after around a year, which at the time he was discharged to be cared for in North Church. Charity schools were founded at this time for the poor, but they did not include children with disabilities and therefore disabled children were unlikely to receive an education. On this slide, I have also highlighted the terms at the time that were historically used that are now ableist and non-inclusive language. Now I'm going to discuss disability in the context of the end of the Georgian to Edwardian period. At the beginning of the 19th century, a few hundred people were living in nine small charitable asylums. But by 1900, more than 100,000 individuals were in 120 county pauper asylums. A further 10,000 were in the workhouses. This happened largely because society now thought that giving financial relief to people in their own homes would encourage laziness. The truly destitute would be helped, but only in the workhouse, where no one wanted to stay for long. Society did not understand how this would impact a disabled person and people with mental health conditions. The 1834 Poor Law Act led to 350 grim new workhouses being built, one within roughly every 20 miles. Earlier workhouses had housed the destitute disabled of the local parish and their buildings were of a more humane design. They were intended, these ones were intended to be miserable places to live with Spartan conditions and harsh work regimes. That the individuals that were classed as the able-bodied poor at the time avoided them if they could. So disabled people and people with mental health conditions were moved into them. There was a new class of medical professional at the time, the alienist, later known as the psychiatrist. At first, alienists believed asylums were peaceful places where patients could be restored by moral treatment, with a focus on the medical model mode of treatment. By, but by the end of the century, they had lost their therapeutic optimism and believed that most patients were incurable. Fewer and fewer people ever left. In 1908, the Royal Commission on the, on the Care and Control of the Feeble-Minded recommended the compulsory sterilization of individuals with learning disabilities and mental health conditions, which was an act that Sir Winston Churchill himself supported. On this slide, I have highlighted terms that are also his, were historically used at the time, but are now ableist and not inclusive language. The next section contains references to ableist terms at the time, institutionalism, and eugenics. It should take around 10 to 15 minutes. Now I'm going to discuss disability in the context of World War I and World War II, which was a really dark time for disabled individuals. Charles Darwin's half-cousin, Sir Francis Galton, founded the term eugenics in 1883. 
In 1907, Sybil Gatto founded the Eugenics Education Society with the aim to promote the research and understanding of eugenics. In 1909, the first eugenics review was published. This led many countries, including the US and most European countries, to adopt eugenics programs. This then imposed measures such as marriage prohibitions and forced sterilizations of people they deemed unfit for reproduction. Those deemed unfit to reproduce often included people with mental or physical disabilities, people who scored in the low ranges on IQ tests, criminals and deviants, and members of disfavored minority groups in the idea that this would perfect the human race, thus also promulgating scientific racism, which the Nazis then adopted, these beliefs which were used to propagate a mass genocide during the Holocaust. Prominent members of the eugenic society and movement were Neville Chamberlain, Sybil, Sybil um, Gatto, Neville Rolfe, Winston, Winston Churchill, and John Maynard Keynes. When almost two million newly disabled British ex-servicemen came home from the battlefronts of the First World War, some attitudes had to change. They were heroes who had sacrificed their bodies for the nation. This led to prosthetic advancement, sheltered employment being created, and new housing to be built for disabled ex-servicemen. Despite these changes, disabled civilians didn't always benefit. Rural, rural colonies were established for people with learning disabilities. At the that time, they were known as the mentally deficient. The colonies were self-contained small worlds in which disabled people were isolated from the outside world, but, and segregation by sex, age, and ability was strict. These colonies existed till the 1990s. On this slide, I've also highlighted terms that were historically used at the time and are now ableist and non-inclusive terms. Now I'm going to discuss disability in the context of 1945 to present day. At the end of the war, horrors em emerged, including the mass killing of disabled people in Germany, which in reaction to the Nazis' abuses, um, the eugenist theories were uh, pr purported, the sterilization and isolation of disabled people were stigmatized. The 1944 Disability Employment Act created employment quotas, reserved occupations, and promised sheltered employment for disabled people. In, 1960s, in the 1960s and 1970s, the civil rights movement inspired disabled people to take direct action against discrimination, inequality, and poor access, leading to a social model versus the medical model of disability. The Disability Discrimina Discrimination Act was passed in 1995. The social model of disability focus on, focuses on people's rights as members of society, focusing on ensuring access. In 1948, there was a wheelchair archery competition, which was the humble beginnings of the Paralympics Games. The Quality Act was passed in 2010, and the United Nations Convention um, to, promote, uh, to Promote Disability Rights. This next section is going to contain references to hate crime, abuse, discrimination, and institutionalism. It should take around five to 10 minutes. There has been a lot of progress over the years, but there's still active discrimination and violence that the disability community faces. 10 years on the abuse atrocities that happened at Winterbourne View Care Home have still not been solved by the government, going back on their promises. During the lockdown, there has been a stark increase in cyberbullying of disabled individuals. There are three cases I've included on the slides where disabled individuals were killed by the police, their parents, or other teenagers, demonstrating the level of violence that the community faces. Even with the passing of the Equality Act, there are still issues with discrimination in the workplace. Disability services were decreased during the pandemic, making the community feel forgotten. The housing crisis is set to get worse for the disabled community as two thirds of new homes that are set to be built in England over the next decade will not be fully accessible. The Israeli Prime Minister was unable to access the COP26 as the venue was not fully wheelchair accessible. There are still cases of sterilization and Mental Health Act is still continues to institutionalize people. The next section contains references to ableist language and should take around five to 10 minutes. Now we're gonna look at language usage. Throughout the presentation, I've included historical language to demonstrate how there is a lingering historical impact and sentiments that are associated with historical terms that are still used today, which are ableist language. The left side details some of the terms that you should avoid and others have been included throughout the presentation as they are ableist terms. The government has detailed a list of terms that are on the right that are inclusive terms to use. 
The word disabled is a description, not a group of people. Use disabled people, not the disabled, as the collective term. Don't automatically refer to disabled people in all communications. Many people who need disability benefits and services don't identify with this term. Consider using people with health conditions if it seems more appropriate. Avoid passive victim words. Use language that respects disabled people as active individuals with control over their own lives. When in doubt, always ask the individual how they would like their disability to be addressed. Now we're gonna look at some behavioral tips. The government guidance suggests some behavioral tips for interacting with disabled individuals. I believe that they're just being a good corporate citizen. Do not talk down or patronize the individual and maintain a normal tone of voice. Address, address the disabled person directly, even if they have a companion or an interpreter. Speak to disabled people like you'd speak to everyone else. Do not focus too much on being too cautious or politically correct, as focusing on being super sensitive to the wrong and right language and depictions will stop you from doing anything at all. Never attempt for, uh, to finish the other a sentence for the person you're talking to.